Hallelujah. Come on, let's continue to give him a praise this morning. Because we have a home, not only here on this earth, but in heaven. Because we have a father, not only in our natural lives, but also in our spiritual lives. And because we have a father, we have someone that we can emulate. I'm always, you know, being a kid that didn't grow up with a dad, I needed somebody to emulate. And so my mom introduced me to the father. And introducing me to the father, she gave me somebody to emulate. Now, I don't know about you, but it's really tough to emulate God. It's really difficult to think about Jesus and say, I need to be like him. But somehow through the fog of life and the challenges of day to day, I actually began to ask God, who are you? Who are you? If you want me to follow you, you're going to have to reveal yourself to me. And you know something? He began to reveal himself to me. And so when I encourage you to know God and really search after him and know who he is in spirit and in truth, it's because that journey was so core to my life. And that journey's still going on. We don't just find God and then it's over. We actually continue to search after him and we learn new things every single day. How many of you would say amen to that? You see, it's a continuing journey with God. We don't just magically arrive, but that should also be the encouragement of our life because every day you can know something new about God. Every day you can find something new about God. Every day you get to open your heart and open your life and open your mind and say, God, show me something different today. But in that, you have to have a purity of saying to yourself, I want to know God for who he is, not who I think he is. I want to know God for who he says he is, not just what opinions are about him. And when you get into that position, you humble yourself, then you begin to really start to see him. He's a funny kind of God. He wants you to know him for who he really is. He doesn't want you to look through a cloud and say, I think I see you, but I'm not sure. He actually wants you to see him clearly and distinctly so that you can know who you love. You see, you have to know who you love. Before you can say you love God, you got to know God. Can you say amen to that? You got to say, you, you got to know God in order to be able to say you love God. And so today, just simply, I want you to understand that Open Embrace Link also has something to do with our relationship with God. And we start that relationship open to who he says he's, he is. We're open to who he says he is. We, op we are open to how he presents himself in the word of God. We're open to how he presents himself in his spiritual word as he speaks to us. And we embrace that. That's what we embrace. We begin to embrace God for who he says he is, and we're open to who he's going to tell us he is. And in the midst of that, there's something magic that happens when we start to embrace him and he embraces us, and that is we become merged together with him. Can you say amen? We become blended with him. We become a part of him. He becomes a part of us. And somewhere in the middle of that, we become linked together such that we can walk out this life with God every day. That's the miracle of the relationship that he wants with you. Not just that you would know him in some weird kind of distant way, but that you would abide with him and you would be linked to him. And every single day you would understand him deeper and deeper and deeper. And he would be your daddy. He would become your daddy. And you would know him and you would call out to him and you would say, daddy, come seek me and find me. And then you'd realize he was there with you all or you'd cry out to him in the middle of the night and he would answer you. And you would know him fully. That's the kind of relationship God wants with you. I want you to understand that this morning. But I also want you to understand that open embrace link has something to do with your relationship with him. That you go through that process as well. And in that, at the center of that, it's going to be love, it's going to be comfort, it's going to be care, it's going to be hope, it's going to be faith, it's going to be all the things. Let's pray this morning because I want to welcome you to Sozo. And I want you to rem be reminded that Sozo is a word that's a Greek word that's captured in Scripture. And the reason we picked it is because it has so many of the deeper meanings about our relationship with God and the fullness thereof. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Sozo. 
we, we believe you ordained this church to be here. I know a lot of people think they saved it. Maybe there are days I, I thought I saved it. But God, you saved it. And you're the one that sustains it. So we give this church back over to you, God. We say Sozo is under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And because of that, it's sustainable. Because of that, it has a mission. Because of that, it has a purpose. Because of that, it will persevere and it will go forward toward that purpose. So God, we thank you. We ask you to continue to send people of like hearts to this church that we might love on them and they would fulfill and fill in the blanks of what we're missing. And we thank you, God, and we praise you. We do so in Jesus' name and all agree with that prayer said. Come on, give them the glory this morning. Thank you, Lord.
you say and bright me your heart is you found me unconditionally you love me before I could speak you had
There is power in feeling loved. There is power in knowing God's love for you. And that power transcends through everything that you do and everything that you say and everything that you feel. And often we feel so lost and empty and broken and wretched because we don't know God's love and it's not pressing through us. It's just not coming out of us. Now, it's not anybody's fault because God knew that we would be desperate like that. He knew that we would need his love. He knew that we would have to search for him because if we would grope in the darkness for him, which is what Scripture says, it wasn't going to be that easy. It was going to be difficult. It would be like it was you're groping for something that you can't see, but you know it's there. And God knew that we would be groping in the darkness for him for one reason or the other. We would be blind to him for one reason or the other. Our hearts would be broken. For one reason or another, we'd come from a place where we were desperate for him and we would certainly be searching for him. And in the midst of that, our God says that he would surround us with the light and he would actually come for us. There's something powerful about knowing God is willing to come for you. That no matter where you are or what you've done, God is willing to come for you. Can you say amen? And so for people that are out there, we have to help them understand that God is willing to come for them. How many of you agree with that? God's willing to come for them. God is willing to come for them. And many times they're like, man, you don't know what I've done. You're right, I don't know what you've done, but God knows what you've done, and he still died on the cross for you. God knows what you're going to do, and he still died on the cross for you. God knows all the bad stuff about you, but he's not reminding you of the bad stuff. He's trying to help you understand the good stuff. Can you say amen? He is not interested in reminding you of your past because he wants your future. And so those things become things that not only do we understand from God, but we start to mimic that with each other. How many of us need to stop reminding each other of our past in order for each other to be able to see our future? How many of you would say, hallelujah, praise the Lord? Because we do do that. And sometimes it's because we're still stuck in our own sin consciousness. It's called an evil conscience in Ephesians. And what an evil conscience is, is your consciousness of the sin that you committed, even though God already forgave you for it. Can you say hallelujah? Even See, God's the one that says, I forget. I put it into the sea of forgetfulness. I've forgotten your sin. You know why? Because it's been covered and washed in the blood, and it's been washed clean. That's how God forgets about it. But the reality is that many times we can't forget, we can't let go, and we can't get free. Somebody say amen. We can't get free. It's not God's fault. It's, it's us. And yes, it can be people in your lives that want to always remind you of all the bad stuff you did. Nobody here has done that. And sometimes it's because they feel guilty. It's because they feel like, con oh, I'm condemned. Well, nobody can get God, Jesus came to not condemn you. Jesus came and he said, you're already condemned. I don't need to condemn you. How many of you know that? Jesus doesn't condemn us. Jesus doesn't condemn you. He didn't come to condemn you. He came because you were condemned. Somebody say amen. I'll say it again. Jesus came because you were condemned. Jesus came because you were condemned. And so if there's anything that you should be excited about knowing Jesus came is that he came because you were condemned so that he could uncondemn you. Somebody say hallelujah. That's what Jesus is here to do. He's here to uncondemn you. Somebody say hallelujah. These simple things become things that we have to confess because God didn't come to condemn you. He came to convince you that you were condemned because you were already condemned. That was something that was already done. There was no debate about that. The debate should be that Jesus Christ came to set you free and to uncondemn you. Somebody say, come on, y'all ain't cheered enough. He came to uncondemn us. That's what he came for. And so our gospel really should be focused more on the uncondemned, the uncondemnation, not the condemnation. Somebody say amen. The uncondemnation. Well, pastor, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the uncondemnation, the redemptive work of God. The forgiveness part of Jesus Christ. The blood having already been spilled. The mercy seat in heaven. Anybody know there's a physical mercy seat in heaven? It's not just some allegory. It ain't just some words in the Bible. There's a physical place called the mercy seat of Christ. Somebody say hallelujah. 
Yes, the things in heaven are models of, of spiritual realities. This is why God paints the pictures of heaven in the Bible, and we should understand what they look like. And this is why he describes what heaven looks like. He describes what the throne room looks like. He describes what the throne of grace is there for, so that we would believe in it, and we would understand that there is a model in heaven that reinforces the Bible and what it tells you is available to you. Can you say amen to that? And so if there is forgiveness of sins then there must be a mercy seat because there has to be somewhere where those sins are actually washed clean and there has to be a reality of blood having been spilled because the remission of sins only comes with the spilling of blood. Please tell me you understood that. That's what the Old Testament, as goofy as it is, can remind you of. That there was, there's no remission of sin without the spilling of blood. Somebody say hallelujah. But Jesus then became the blood that was spilled and that's why the mercy seat is in heaven, to remind you that you've been forgiven. Please, somebody say amen. That's what the mercy seat's for. That's what the blood of Jesus is for. You heard me pray the blood of Jesus over people. I, yeah, we're forgetting traditions that work. Pleading the blood of Jesus over somebody is a good idea. It is not just a religious tradition. It is actually something that works. Why? I just told you why. Because the reality is there's a mercy seat in heaven covered with Jesus' blood. And I, so what's loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. What's bound on earth is bound. So I appropriate the blood from that mercy seat and I place it on people so that they are protected and they are covered. Please, can you say amen? See, if we got to believe that there's a connection between the spiritual and the natural. we got to see a connection. And so that Old Testament stuff that we read about, and everybody last week admitted that they hate Leviticus. Somebody say hallelujah. <clears throat> Except it looks like our, our culture is reinstituting re Leviticus, right? It's just like all these laws and mandates and things like that. We, we, we're okay with that, but, but we hated Leviticus, right? I mean, it, it's just an interesting parallel that we're seeing. Now, certainly things that can help us are good for us. Somebody say Amen. Those, those, those regulations that help us, that can keep us safe, are good things. And so all of a sudden we understand that. Now people are like, ah, Leviticus ain't so bad. Why? Because it was, giving us, it was giving us things that would protect us. Do everybody agree with that? Now, there, so I would certainly say Leviticus is not what we're looking at anymore because we've got protective things that are more spiritual and much more effective now. Everybody okay with that idea? So Leviticus was superseded by what is the new covenant. And if you don't understand that, we can talk more about that. Um, I will always, always admonish you, if I say something you don't understand, the worst person you can go to is not me. I'll say it again. If I say something you don't understand, the worst person you can go to is not me. Somebody say amen. There are things that I know, understand, and will articulate that may go over your head. And you might be like, Pastor, what would you mean by that? Well, you know what? Uh, I'm a funny kind of guy. I actually sit out there before service pretty often. And if you got a question, you need, to, you need to person up and come talk to me about it. Can you say amen? That's, right. That's out of respect for me. I know people are like, well, I just go to church and I don't have any responsibility to the pastor. You doggone sure do. Okay? You do. At the very least, show me enough respect to say, I didn't understand that. Can you help me understand it? You may still disagree with me. Praise the Lord. That's okay. But at least you'll get an answer that's complete. And nobody else can, actually, there's nobody else in this church. There are very few people in this church that can explain what I'm telling you. Very, hmm? It should be that way, okay? Because what God does in a pastor is he puts together a number of different components. He puts history. He puts their own personality. He uses it. And so sometimes when they say things and you don't understand it, the best thing you can do is go talk to that person. And, and the good thing about a small church, if this was Crossroads, I would, I'd give you all the passes all day long and say, there's no way you can get to that pastor. I would give you that. I'd be like, there's no way you're going to get to him, <laughs> okay? There's, there's several layers of protection, number one. Number two, he's got thousands of people he's trying to relate to. And so when you're in a small church, do you know that that's a benefit to you? Come on. 
I mean, at the very least, you can check into my life. I've seen too many places where pastors are, they have the secret life of the pastor, and you don't know the guy's going to a massage parlor. And that's because the church is too doggone big for you to figure it out, and there's too many layers of protection around that person. You can't see their life. You know y'all could come over to my house after church? Did you know that? I know that may shock you. That may shock you. I will always be there. See, then it's like, well, pastor, what do you do after service besides rest? No, don't engage me after service with a bunch of critiques and, and haranguing me. Don't do that, okay? Just be respectful. After service, I'm usually coming down, I'm reviewing the tape. I'm actually going through in my head what's gone, what I've said on, on Sunday. I'm actually going through that. And so I'm sort of winding down, I'm quieting down, you know, I'm relaxing. If the devil's after me at that point, that's the wrong time to engage me. Please, somebody say amen. Oh, nothing ever happens to the pastor after service. Oh, he just goes to get coffee or a beer or something. No, there's usually a process that God brings me down and relaxes me, right? And, but but there's, there's openness, there's an ability to discuss things. There's an ability to have a, a, a respectful conversation. Underline respectful. Please, somebody say amen. amen. Just be respectful. Just be, that's all you got to do. But again, the benefit of a small church is you get to check that person out. When I say something, if it's out of sync or I do something different, it's going to be really obvious to you. You'll wander over my house and you'll see me doing something goofy. What could happen? What's the worst thing a pastor could do after service at home? Anybody got any idea? Um... A keg? I do sleep. I'm just like ah, spiritually tired sometimes. I get really quiet. What's the worst thing a pastor could do after service? I'm trying to conjure that up because I have no idea. What's the worst thing I could do at home after service? See, nobody can think this one through. Nobody, nobody right? I don't know. I mean, now that's pretty close. They caught pastor watching Lifetime. And that's a funny joke because it's like, I tease Tara. It's like, isn't that television for women? I'm not allowed to watch that. Right? Because that's what it used to be. It was like Lifetime, television for women. So you couldn't, like men shouldn't watch it. And it's always the guys are the bad guys. They're the evil ones. They're killing everyone and destroying everything. And the heroines are the ladies, right, kind of thing. Yeah, that might fit. Don't catch me watching Lifetime after service. But just to encourage you, that's an important thing, right? I mean, you do get access to me at a level that you probably don't get other pastors access because they're busy, because they got lots of things to do. Now, most people do after service. They're still like, okay, so you were talking to three or four people. I don't want to interrupt. Make an appointment. Sit down with me. If you got a question, I got answers. Somebody say amen. And especially if there's something I say, shoot, I, I could be wrong or I could be right and you could be wrong. <laughs> Somebody say amen. But you got to be willing to have that conversation in order to determine that. Amen? But I want to encourage you that God is good and what he's doing in this church is a good thing. I don't think this is a church that's, that's sort of randomly formed. I believe God has his stamp on it. I believe God has given us his DNA for the church. And we will continue to promote that. We will continue to move it forward because I believe that makes the church last. How many of you know how long this church has been here? I don't know. Is it 30? It's actually longer than that. Um, before so, yeah, no matter what it was, how long has it been here before? It has. I know. Your mom, yeah. Huh? 41. 40, 40, yeah, it's like 40. 40 years. Can you believe? Come on. Somebody give that praise report, man. That's awesome. 1980, essentially 80, you know, 41 years is this church has been in existence. It was in Blue Ash for a period of time. It was Living Word for a period of time. It became Sozo how long ago? Three years ago. And it's still, it's still God's hand on it. It's got the same, essentially the same DNA, but it was reformed in order to be a little bit more uh, not relevant, that's not the word I'm looking for, but to really project the message of the gospel in a fresh and different way. That's the reason we changed it, and so it behooves us to take the message out in that fresh and new way. Can you say amen? amen. 
And that's what Sozo is trying to carry us forward with. So be encouraged. God is still doing lots of good work. Again, if you have questions, come talk to me, not somebody else. Nobody else here can represent the answers that I would give you. They can get close, but you're safer coming to me. We've been talking about hitting our stride, and I really want to go back to that because as I think about it, and particularly this, this week, I shared with you how much intercessory prayer I've been in. And it's been by virtue of God walking with me. It's not been my idea. It's, I ain't all that. It's been God saying, walk with me, son. It's him saying, walk with me. And I'll tell you, it's overwhelming. When God takes you down a path where you have no control about where you're going or how, what you're going to experience, I'm here to tell you, there's a reverence that comes with that. Please say amen. There's a reverence. And so what I was talking about last Sunday, it is always prophetic. And I said, you empty yourself so that God can fill you up and can actually take you down a journey. And lo and behold, that's what my week was like. It was a journey with Jesus Christ where he was walking me through it. It wasn't a journey I was taking. It wasn't my idea. It was guided by the Holy Spirit. It was unchained. It was something I've never experienced before because I was out of control of it. I was completely out of control of it. I, did, I couldn't tell you where my emotions were going to go next because God was going to take me to my emotions. Can you say amen to that? He was going to show me his. And so I consider that an honor that God felt like this week I was going to be open enough for him to share with me what he's really thinking and feeling. And he took me down that path. And in the midst of that, I started to see depth in him and in me that was different. I started to see things inside of me that were more capable, they were possible now because I was walking with Jesus. And no, do I walk with Jesus all the time, every single day? Absolutely not. Okay, let me just unpack that right now. I am not always in tune with the spirit of the living God, and yet I know the difference between the two. I know when I am and I know when I'm not. But he took me down a path. I'm weeping in the car. I am crying out. I am calling on God. I am saying, God, you, you made a promise to that person about what you were going to do. You promised them. And I was, I was going back through Scripture saying, but God, you promised that the people of faith you would always support. You promised that you would show your glory if we would actually lend our trust to you. And I was reminding him of the word. Now understand, in order to walk with Jesus Christ, you have to talk like Jesus Christ. You, 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 there is a, there's a problem sometimes when we talk like human beings to God. I know that's going to sound weird, but the problem is because God is trying to renew your mind so that you would think like him. Somebody say amen. amen. See, when Jesus Christ says, I'm trying to transform you into the image of Christ and give you the mind of Christ, what he's telling you is that you start to project that back to him and there will be a much more vital relationship that you have with Jesus because you are acting and talking and thinking like him. Can you say amen to that? It is harder. When I was in that place where it was just me and it was like Steve thinks this way and I think God is that way, it's harder to have a relationship. How can two, two walk together unless they be agreed? Please, somebody say amen. I need to agree with Jesus in order to walk closer to him. Can you say hallelujah to that? I need to agree with him in order to walk closer to him. I don't need to be at odds with Jesus Christ. I don't need to be using my own thinking. Lean not unto my own understanding. Somebody please say amen. amen. And when my own understanding gets in between me and Jesus Christ, I'm having a debate with him. Guess who loses? I do. I do. And so what Jesus has to then do is reorient my thinking. Am I the only one that needs my, thinking, my stinking thinking cleaned up? Am I the only one that needs to be transformed into the image of Christ? Do you understand that being transformed into the image of Christ is to be able to have oneness with Christ so that you can have that intimacy at all times? Can you say amen? amen. That was worth the price of admission. Yes. This is where God is trying to help us understand what that intimacy looks like. And just like we were talking about the intertwining, that knot, that thing of, you know, God talks about being abiding with him. You know, that's being intertwined with Jesus Christ at a level that you can't tell the difference between him and you. Can you say amen? You can't tell the difference between him and you. This week, for a minute, for moments, I couldn't tell the difference between me and him. I couldn't tell the difference between how I felt and how he feels. 
I couldn't tell the difference between what he's thinking about people that I'm praying for and what I was thinking about those very same people. Can you say amen to that? And in the blur, I was like, God, I can see clearly now. I can see clearly now. That's where I want to be. Now, I got to figure out how to hit that stride all the time. I got to figure out how to be close to God so that he can share with me what he's thinking and how. And, and, and then all of a sudden, my prayers are like his prayers. Can you say amen? My prayers are his prayers. I'm praying like him. And you know what? When I read the Bible and I know Jesus prayed for people, what happened to people when Jesus prayed for them? What happened for people when Jesus prayed for them? They were healed. They were transformed. Did, did Jesus ever miss it? Do you remember when I was saying that one of the things I wrestle with is the fact when I go into a hospital that, that what happens for me is not what I see in Scripture? Do you remember that? Do you understand God is trying to answer that question for me? Amen. It's, it has to be. It must be. And when God gives a name, he actually gives a future and a purpose. How many of you know that? And so, yeah, if God's going to call us Sozo, he decided to call us Sozo. We are convinced as a team that God decided to call us Sozo. Can you say amen? Wow. We didn't just come. That wasn't just pastor said. It really was. People were like, nah, that feels about right. Now, was it an audible word from God? No, but it was a group of people who felt like, no, Sozo is the right thing. And when, God, when we allowed God to put that on us, there's an anointing and there's also a purpose that comes with that word that we have to fulfill. Can you say amen? And yes, healing is one of those things that we have to fulfill. So I guess I'm just on track with what God wants to do. And so the questions I'm asking are like, well, how do I pray like Jesus? Did you hear, did you hear that? How do I pray like Jesus? Well, you know, I got to think like Jesus. I got to walk like Jesus. I got to feel like Jesus. And I got to be intimate with Jesus so that I can pray like Jesus. Somebody say amen. And now I fully expect that when I start acting like that and walking like that and feeling like that and praying like that, that I will get Jesus' results. Can you say amen to that? And that people will get healed. I've never had a problem with believing people are going to be healed when I pray for them. But God has taken me to a new level on that thing. And I think he's doing that because the challenges that we're going to face are going to be bigger than they were in the past. Can you say amen? And see, I believe that scripture that says where sin abounds, there does grace that much abound. And so again, when I look at this world, if I think it's getting darker, I also believe that God is bringing the light. Can you say amen? Y'all be like, Pastor, Pastor but you're going to scare us. You're making us feel bad about it. No, uh-uh. You didn't hear me then. You didn't hear me then. Because when I see darkness, I know light is coming in bigger measure. When I see darkness, I know that God is coming to dispel the darkness. When I see darkness, I know that God is going to come in like a flood and flood it with light. Can you say amen? And so, no, I don't see darkness when I see darkness. I actually see the response to darkness, which is always the light. And so it encourages me. I want you to be encouraged. I don't want you to look at things and just say, well, no, pastor sees a dark. No, I don't see a dark future at all. I don't. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Because I know God. Amen. Thank you. I see a future where the greatest revival that's ever hit this world is going to hit this world. I see a future where the revival is actually going to come to this church. Can you say amen? Yeah. I see a future that says when we are all in that place or many of us are in that place where we've emptied ourselves of ourself and we have become intimate with Jesus Christ, that we will be able to pray like we're supposed to pray and receive the answered prayers that we're supposed to receive. That's what I believe. And I'm preparing myself for it. So my encouragement to you is start to prepare. Start to prepare. Now, y'all will be like, well, do I have to do work? No, you actually just got to release yourself. It really is, that he, just like the song says, that, you know, our God's strength becomes manifest in our weakness. It is when we let go of what we think we're strong in that our Heavenly Father fills us up to overflowing. But when God fills us up to overflowing, His power, His energy, and His ability is unlimited. 
And so what we're exchanging is our limits for his limitlessness. What we're exchanging is our inability to pray for people's healing for his ability to heal all. Are you hearing me this morning? His ability to heal all. Jesus didn't miss a mark. If somebody had a demon on them, Jesus knocked it out of them. If somebody had an issue of blood, Jesus raised them up. If whatever it was that they were dealing with, Jesus set them free of it. And that's what sozo is. Can you say amen? This is where God wants to take us. Now, we have to be willing to get on his agenda is the other thing that he's been impressing upon me. What he showed me this week was, if you're on my agenda, then I'll take you where I want you to go. If you're on my agenda, then you will feel what I want you to feel. If you're on my agenda, I will give you the thoughts you should have, and I will give you the prayers to pray and the people to pray for them. Can you say amen? And I will give you burdens. Do you know God gives you a burden? Scripture says it. What does it say about God? What does it say about Jesus' burdens? What does it say? His yoke is easy and, and his burden is light. But I thought we didn't have any burden. I thought we were free of all that. Amen. It is. It's your, your, I mean, what a, what a privilege to actually co-labor with Jesus. In other words, his burden becomes yours. His children become your focus. It could be. In that moment, it could be that one sheep. And he says, I, don't, I know what your agenda was today, and it's not good enough. Your agenda now is that person. Your agenda now is that person in the hospital. My agenda this week, it was one person. It was one person. It was one person that needed to be prayed for. And that burden's not lifted yet. It's not over. And the debate I was having with God was like, aren't there a bunch of other people that need prayer? Thank you. He has a bunch of other people who've been praying. And you see what my brain, my brain did. I'm like, oh, God, I think I have a better plan. I want to smear my prayer across 20 other people. He said, don't you dare do that. He said, I want you to pray for this person. He says, I'm going to give you a burden for that person, and you're going to... You're going to carry it until I tell you to stop. And he hasn't told me to stop yet. Now, the interesting thing about burdens that God gives you is you've got to have faith for that. you got to have faith for that. you got to believe you're God. You have to have an experience where you believe that the prayers that you give for that person and over that person for as long as you're giving it, that God is going to answer you. And in the midst of that, God said, faith is so important to you, isn't it? Faith is the way you live, isn't it? Faith is the way we're supposed to walk, isn't it? And he said, have you forgotten that? Have you forgotten it? Because we want strength in life, we want victory in life, but we're not willing to be faithful in life sometimes. We're not willing to be faith-filled. We're not willing to walk it out by faith and not by sight. We're not willing to see God the way he sees it and just press in until it's done. That's what he did. And maybe that was just for me, because I'm a knucklehead and God wants to fix me. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because if that was the lesson that he was going to teach me, I'm going to take that lesson to the bank and I'm going to live that lesson out now. I'm going to remember that lesson. Does that make sense? And every, every, pretty much the whole week, what was reverberating in my heart was the just shall walk by faith. By faith. By faith. By faith. And he also encouraged me that if there are people in your life that are trying to walk things out by faith, do not discourage them from walking it out by faith. Don't steal their faith in the process. Don't take the faith away from them. That You don't know what journey they're going to have down the road and whether their faith muscle is going to have to be developed or not. 
Don't you tell them to stop walking by faith. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. Don't you dare. Because unless you're going to save them down the road, let God do what he needs to do with them. Amen? So the surrender piece, and it was part of the six, and I'm just not going to go through it. I want you to understand, you know, this process of hitting your stride with God. All of a sudden, the centerpiece of the, the message became hitting your stride with Jesus. In other words, being able to walk alongside Jesus and have him walk alongside you, and you actually hitting a stride together. In other words, you're actually pacing each other so that you're walking this thing out with him. Does, he, does that make sense to you? We're hitting our stride. Now, we talked about husbands and wives hitting their stride together. You know, there's so many ways you can see it. But I think the important thing today is that we see ourselves walking it out with Jesus. The stride you want to hit, the person you want to agree with is actually Jesus Christ. How many of you would agree with that? The person you want to be in agreement with, ain't you know, your spouse is important, but they ain't going to take you to heaven and their blood ain't on the mercy seat. Somebody say amen. That your, your salvation is based on Jesus Christ and him alone. So one of the most critical people you should be in alignment with is Jesus Christ. And surrendering to his will and his causes becomes a critical piece. And remember I talked about 2 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to rattle through it. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Always remember that that God has given us everything we need to live. There's nothing missing in the Word of God. There's nothing missing relative to the gospel. You know, I know there's plenty of people out there that can give you advice, but God is the one that's got the best advice. Somebody say amen. amen. And that's called the Word of God. <laughs> it's the best advice you can get, right? And it says everything to pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by his own glory and excellence. This isn't about the opinions you have about the word of God. It's about listening to God and getting the knowledge of him. Somebody say amen. The knowledge of him. I know you're going to be like, yeah, but how do you get that? One of the ways is you get close to him so that you know and he speaks to you. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 4 and it says, by, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. Woo! Partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, for this very reason, also applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. And it keeps going, and it says, and in your self-knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, finally, and for, for mostly, love. But here's what I would take you through here. Love doesn't express itself just from an emotional perspective. It really is that you exercise many of these other things before you can love people. Somebody say amen. Self-control is required to love others. How many of you would agree? Amen. Knowledge is required to love others. Perseverance is required. Oh my goodness, is required to love others. Somebody say amen. Godliness is required to love others. I think some of us are like, no, I just need to accept what everybody else is doing in order to love them. That's not love. That's not love. There's a certain level of godliness we should expect and require from one another. How many of you agree? We should expect and require it, right? My wife expects certain godliness out of me. If I'm going to be disparaging of her, I'm going to cheat on her, you think that makes for a loving relationship? Most of us, we'd be like, no. Well, then that applies to you, too. Somebody say amen. It applies to you, too. There's a certain level of godliness you've got to have in your life in order to truly be loving towards other people. And so don't forget this list because it actually helps you understand the manifestation of love comes after much of this fruit. I'll leave it there. Because people are like, oh, just love everybody. Do you know how hard it is to love people? <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> you know how hard it is to love people? You need lots of these things in order to love people. Well, yeah, perseverance. Oh, i got to have a brotherly kindness towards them. Yes, you have to develop those things. And so what the Scripture is trying to remind us, and it says is, for if, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, these things are requirements of character. Somebody say amen. They're the requirements of character. 
You don't just get to say you love people because you could be a liar. If you're going to love people, you have to have a certain level of character in order to do so just like Jesus did. Somebody say amen. And so these things have to increase in you. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. In other words, you got cleansed, but you forgot to walk the path. You got cleansed, but you didn't grow up. One of the things the church is here to do, besides to encourage, is to edify. Somebody tell me what edify means. What does it mean to edify? What, so describe what, what building up looks like. Teach, okay, so that's one. So you're supposed to come out of church learning something. What else is edification supposed to do for the believer? Encourage, talk about encouragement. Anything? Yeah, but, but, but it's, it's building up internal ability. It's building up faith and hope, right? Encouragement is putting courage in so that you can walk things out. What did you say? Maturity. Talk about maturity. So, so we're here for a purpose, right? What about the maturing part of it? Yeah, it's sort of growing up. It's not that we're doing the same things that we were a year ago. We're not remembering our evil conscience from 10 years ago. We are actually growing into a place where we're maturing and we're able to take on more and more. Please, somebody say amen. amen. I think sometimes we have to remind ourselves why we go to church. Because sometimes it's like, well, you know, I, everything should be warm and fuzzy. Well, it might not be because you're being edified. Somebody say amen. amen. Because you're being challenged, because you're being convicted, because God is getting a hold of you. And because Jesus is like, no, I want a closer tie with you. But in order to do that, i got to wake you up a little bit. I might have to splash some coffee in your face. Somebody say amen. Or I might have to give you a cup of coffee. That's kinder and gentler, right? I might have to give you a cup of coffee, and God might be like, meh, this isn't working for you. This isn't working. So we should be tolerant of the various things that God wants to do in the church. Somebody say amen. Let's go to Colossians, because we're going to end in the scripture. Then we're going to go to a picnic, and we're going to throw hot dogs at each other. And I hear we have Nerf guns. Now, those are illegal in heaven. You do realize that. Did you know Nerf guns are illegal in heaven? No, y'all don't believe me? Come on. Come on. <laughs> right? No, they're illegal in heaven. I said so. Water guns, only holy water. There we go. From home, from the faucet. <laughs> what? That, but I did, didn't I? But this time I want you to believe the word from the pulpit. You are not allowed to go check this word anywhere. You are under my spell, right? It's like, uh, hopefully you never <laughs> even consider that, right? <laughs> Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. I won't be able to unpack this all the way, though, which means that you've got some work to do. Because I love this scripture, Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. It says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Can you say amen? We are to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We are to know the will of God. Please, somebody say amen. In its fullness, not just, oh, I think I know what God wants. No, you need to know what his will is in spiritual wisdom and understanding. In other words, you should know what it is and be able to dispatch it so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So we can't walk this thing out until we know the will of God. Somebody say amen. Until you know the will of God for your life, how do you walk it out? If God's going to make you a king and a priest, you, don't you have to walk differently than you're walking today? you got to understand the will of God for your life. you got to understand, I want to make you a king and a priest. I want to make you a man in the workplace that actually carries the mantle not only of the glory of entrepreneurship, but I want a message to go forth. How many of you know Denzel Washington is now preaching the gospel? How many of you knew that? At 60, I think he's 65 years old. And he, his testimony more recently is, God keeps telling me to tend the sheep and feed the lamb. 
Now you can say to yourself, well, it took him a long time. Or you could say this is perfect timing because of the number of people who know of him for him to then get into the pulpit and begin to pull people forward with the scripture and then use his life as an example. I don't know about you, but I think he's going to have a pretty big draw. I think he's going to have a pretty big draw. And he now understands at a different level, because timing is everything, that he has a call of God, knowing the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing. I love this because it didn't say that you stop increasing in the knowledge of God. It actually comes back and it says, not only would you know that his knowledge you would, you would have knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And then it doubles back and it says, increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God. I don't know about you, but the reality is that we're all supposed to continually increase, continually increase in the knowledge of God. Can you say amen? amen. All of us, all the time. But pastor, you're a pastor, so it's, it's just your job. I got news for you. If you're going to walk out the will of God in your life, you better get to work. I'm responsible for walking out the will of God in my life. I'm responsible, and I have been for years, where I would go into corporate environments and somebody would give me a, a CEO. God would give me a CEO, and that CEO would some, for some reason open up and share something about their spiritual lives with me, and in the midst of that, I would withhold from them that I was a pastor because I didn't believe that that was a title to be achieved, but I did believe that the will of God was supposed to work in my life. And so when that presented itself to me, I would say, thank you, God, you've placed them in a position where I can speak into their lives. Can anybody say amen to that? And at a certain point, I became conscious of the fact that the will of God for my life was that I would be a corporate guy that would walk in and would help you with all kinds of different things, and then you would ask me a question about Jesus Christ, and I would answer it. And this is what I'm watching transform in Denzel Washington's life. And I'm looking at this man, and I'm saying, you go, God. You go, God. You knew when to call him forward. You knew when to share with him, and, and the beauty of it, and when I hear him say things like, but all I hear in my head is tend my sheep and feed my lambs. That means he knows the word of God. And so when God spoke that word to him, he knew it was coming from God. Can you say amen? You wonder why you don't know why, what God is saying to you. If you're not reading the word of God, you don't know what he would say to you. You don't know how he talks. And if you don't know how he talks, how are you going to know when the signal comes? How are you going to know how to interpret that? And if you don't understand Colossians, it's like, you know what? You're supposed to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So that you would walk it out. So that all of a sudden this word of God wouldn't just happen on a Sunday morning and a stick in your pocket. But that you would walk it out. You would go home and you would say, but God, you called me to walk this word out. You didn't just give it to me as a curiosity that at some level I have to walk this thing out. I am now responsible for understanding what your will is for my life. And I am now, I am now required, required. To whom much is given, much is required. I am required to do what Jesus is calling me to do. And you wonder why sometimes I push on you, and I know it rattles your cage, and I say things like, you know what, when, if God tells me to do something, I'm ignoring you. It's because the person I'm hitting my stride with is Jesus. It's Jesus. And now I'm going to connect something for you as we close. When the scripture says, and it's Paul talking, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. There's something I saw in that years ago. And here's what it was. How would you know I'm following Christ if you can't see him too? How would you know? How would you know? Until you can see him too.
And the burden that hit me was like a ton of bricks because God reminded me my job isn't to be Jesus for you. My job isn't to always be the one that sees him for you. My job is to preach the gospel so that you would see him too. It's so you see him too. You see, because we can't follow him together until you can see him too. And then when you can see him too, we rejoice together because we both see him moving. Do you see Jesus over there? It's like, yeah, brother, I see him over there. You see what he's doing? Yeah, he's laying hands on people. Isn't that what we should be doing? Isn't that what we should be doing? And yeah, the last part of that is, let's go. If you ever wonder what we're trying to do with Open Embrace Link here, it's, let me punctuate it for you. We're trying to follow Jesus. We're trying to follow Christ. And I may not always get it right, but I need some people who can see him too in order to redirect me, not people who can't see him. Somebody say amen. Stand with me.